Hey everybody, it's the world's coolest reconstructionist, Eric Brown and Phil Relly, and you are listening to the number one show made just for attorneys, expert crash investigators, police officers, and anyone else involved in the investigation, negotiation, and litigation of motor vehicle crashes. Today's episode number 43, tell it how it is. So hold on tight, here we go. Before I finish this intro, another life will be lost to a vehicle crash, and the $500 billion economic impact of vehicle crashes will only keep growing. Are you an attorney, expert witness, police officer, or insurance adjuster in charge of negotiating, investigating, or litigating vehicle collision cases? If so, then you're in the right place. The Expert Angle podcast was created for you because we believe that the industry must evolve, grow, and get better daily. And the only way to do that is by building the best team of experts possible to ensure that these crashes are handled efficiently, accurately, and honestly in order to get justice for the victims. We're Eric Brown and Phil Relly, and this is The Expert Angle. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This episode of the Expert Angle podcast is brought to you by Virtual Crash Accident Reconstruction Software. If you are tired of having to purchase, upkeep, and run multiple programs during an investigation, Virtual Crash is the cure. With Virtual Crash, you can build 3D environments using your actual scene data. You can simulate, animate, and create awesome visuals. You can also use the new momentum analysis tool for vehicle motion. Basically, Virtual Crash is the complete accident reconstruction software solution. Solution. Visit vcrashusa.com today to download your free trial or schedule a live one-on-one demonstration. All right, Phil. So here we are back for another episode. And this is one that I'm really, really excited about because uh, I had the pleasure of reading this gentleman's posts on LinkedIn. And it, they are hilarious on one hand, but they're sad on the other hand, because they're, they're about taking expert depositions. And I think this is one of the things that a lot of our listeners, um, if you're new to this game, it takes a lot of practice to get good at depositions and to enjoy them um, to the point now. I mean, you know, like I love depots. I love, I love court because that's the only time in my life because I live with all women. Uh, it's the only time in my life that everybody has to shut up and listen to me. So, I mean, I, I love it, you know, they have so, to shut up. They don't have to listen to you. That's true. And a lot of times they yell over me, but that's okay. So anyway, so I, I wanted to bring this guest on because he's, he's amazing. He, an attorney out of Texas. Um, like I said, I, I love the stories. Um, he, he's got a good beat, I think on, on what he's doing inside of depots. And I thought this would kind of break the, the, uh, Ice a little bit. So I want to bring uh, and introduce to you guys, Justin Hill. Uh, so Justin, thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, love th- that you took time out of your day to join us and, and you know, share here with our listeners a, a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah. And thanks for having me. And to be honest, uh, I probably get asked once a week or twice a week to be on a podcast, which typically seems to be somebody trying to do link building. But I looked into y'all, y'all run a real podcast. So I'm happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, I'm a plaintiff's lawyer. I'm a personal injury lawyer in San Antonio, Texas. Um, you know, I've kind of gone through a big plaintiff shop onto my own. And because it was sort of a baptism by fire, I got a lot of experience real young as a lawyer. And so I got to take a bunch of depots that people my age didn't get to do. And you're right. I mean, from the witness standpoint to the lawyer standpoint, it's it's about repetitions. Yeah. And, and that's it. I mean, I know you know, Phil, like you, you used to hate depots, uh, you know, when you initially started getting going in this, cause you didn't like the, uh, it, it, it's a whole different ball game. It's a different ball game without your attorney being able to protect you. Yeah. You know? yeah I mean, they're not there to protect you. I mean, if you, if you, if you step back from what it's become, you're supposed to be as an expert witness, the, the person that links the gap between what a lay person knows and what somebody, a technician, somebody with technical skills can teach them. And that's how it should be. And you shouldn't be protected. You should be the expert. Unfortunately, uh, that world has become uh, cluttered with people that just have figured out how to uh, churn a bill and make a bunch of money. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. I, I, you, you hit the nail right on the head right there. And, and we talk about that all the time. And, and I don't know if you guys are starting to see it too, but you know, I think you're starting to see a, a lot of the industry become clogged with what, what we refer to as the liar for hire. Guys that are out here that write an opinion. And it's sad because we've even had the attorneys tell us, they're like, yeah, I just need this opinion written. So I, I, I'm going to call this expert because I can actually write his report for him and he'll just put his name on it. And yeah. I'm like, that's dangerous. 
Yeah. And I think there's kind of a fine line, honestly, because I have hired real technicians, like a plumber, 50 years in plumbing. And that guy doesn't necessarily know how to put together a report. So he doesn't know how to check the legal boxes. So, you know, he's definitely an expert in the, my, you know, my cousin Vinny kind of way expert. (laughs) But then you hire the guys who, like you said, are, Hey, what do you need me to get to? And and I I don't want that either. Cause one thing I'll tell you is I don't think juries get it wrong. I think they sniff that out. I think they just feel it when somebody's that way. So I want an expert who's technically proficient and also knows they've got some boxes they have to check because we have a burden of proof to carry. Or if you're on the defense side, you have a burden of proof you're trying to you know, kill. Yeah. And so I like to ask this question of all the attorneys that come on our show, because I like to, to drive the point home for the experts listening to this. OK, so if you give an expert a case and it's just it's crap. I mean, like this is a no win case. Do you want the guy to use smoke and mirrors or do you want him to be honest with you and say from the rep? Hey, man, this is a tough case to win. I think you're going to have some problems. And this is where I think the problems are going to be. So I think that's where kind of the lawyer is going to have to be a philosophical chooser on how they want to prepare their case. So for me, I think a jury's going to get it right. I think if I hire an expert who's going to say whatever, jury's going to pour me out and I wasted a bunch of money to get poured out. So there are lawyers out there who think they could sell, you know, ice to an Eskimo in front of a jury. And, and I don't believe that. And I think they're probably not that good. Uh, but I need to know early on, am I wasting my money and barking up the wrong tree? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love it. I, you know, and I think that makes a big, big difference. You know, a lot of the attorneys we have on the show are, are guys and girls that we respect um, that are very much that way. And, and that's who like, that's, that's our core bread and butter of who we like to do business with. Yeah. Is, are the people that are like, just give me the honest opinion. If this is a loser, I want to know now before right. I sink tens and $20,000 in this thing to find out it's a loser. And sometimes what you think is a a loser makes me think, okay, I've got a different legal hurdle to cover now because you're there to tell me what happened if you're a reconstructionist or if you're a bio, why they got hurt. And your opinion might in your eyes kill my case, but in my eyes mean, oh, I've just got to pivot to this theory or this, which is all, you know, on the up and up and it's in good faith, but that's where we can pivot our case to do best for our client without being dishonest and trying to make up facts. Yeah. You know, Phil, man, you, uh, you brought that up in a previous show of, you know, it, you may go, you may start out the case saying, Hey, look, is this a speed issue? And we're like, nah, it's not a speed issue. Maybe it's a visibility issue. Right. Maybe it's a vehicle defect issue. Maybe, you know, mm-hmm. who knows? Um, but yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the head. So let's, let's dive down this here a little bit and, and tell me a, a little bit about your background so that people listening that might not know you, I'm, I'm sure everybody in Texas knows you, uh, but you know, people out here on the East coast and, and maybe in New York or something like that, they, they might not know you so that they don't think that, that you're just a, you know, a, a 22, 23 year old kid right out of law school. What's a little bit of your background for everybody. So I'm in my 16th year. Uh, I started at I mean, if you're in Texas, you know the firm I started at. They were a big player and they were probably the biggest player in automotive product liability, automotive product defect cases for a good 15 years in the US. Uh, started in Bronco 2, went to Ford Firestone, Chrysler Liftgate. So my first week on the job, I deposed an accident reconstructionist in a double death tire defect, uh, you know, tire detread case. So I was just thrown right into it. Um, you know, I remember having no idea what I was doing, but I look back on it and think I was super prepared. I would do the exact same thing getting ready for it. So, you know, my career kind of, I, I went into that. I did that for seven years. I, you know, I was spoiled and then I got to work on big cases that other lawyers referred to our firm. And then when I went out on my own, all of a sudden I'm looking at fender bender car wrecks and I have to relearn an entirely different practice area, which is just as much time and work as a big monster case with multiple, you know, fatalities or big insurance policies or whatever. And so I think I have a unique career path and that I started and I got lucky to work on really big cases. Then I had to go out on my own, learn it all on my own, learn the business out on my own and really relearn how to work cases that I never saw in the first seven years of my practice. Yeah. You know what though, but that's what makes, that's what makes a strong lawyer is, is somebody that's, that you know, got to put the work in. And, yeah, and I doesn't, doesn't have it all handed to them. So, yep. you know, hats off to you. It, uh, so you said, you know, an, an interesting thing there, preparing for a deposition. So if, if you don't mind, because we have our, our audience is, is, you know, both on the expert side, police side and the attorney side, if we get rolling first and we talk about police and our experts, because a lot of police officers 
don't have the opportunity to be deposed as much as those of us on the civil side. Sure. And so is there certain things, I mean, what is an expert or a police officer is getting ready to get their deposition taken? I guess first, let's start here. What's the purpose of the deposition as the attorney taking it? I mean, what are you going in here to do? So I think that's also where you get into the philosophical difference of what kind of lawyer and also venue. So I don't know what the rules are in the state y'all are in. In Oregon, there's no expert discovery. So I don't find out who the expert is. I don't get to take their deposition. You show up at trial and it's, you know, learn how to cross-examine. So in Texas, you're allowed deposition. You're allowed to figure out who the experts are, what their opinions are, what the basis are. You know, if, if I think a case is going to trial, it's going to be a little bit different than if I think I need to figure out what the theories are. But generally, I am not trying to lay all my cards on the table uh, in a deposition. Uh, I am trying to find those lines that divide my theory from their theory. And I am also trying to, if I can, in the case, set them up to look really bad in front of a jury. Uh, if I know that they have just gone outside the science, if I know they've gone outside the data, if I know they have they have really relied upon things that just are indefensible, well, I'm not going to tell them in a depot. I'm not going to give them time to fix their, you know, fix their their testimony. But you're also going to see other lawyers who think depots are the time to do everything. So, and sometimes it is when you really have no idea where they're coming from or how you're going to cross them, maybe it is the time to figure out all the facts. So you kind of have a two different angles uh, on how you prepare for a depot, in my opinion, or what the purpose is for the depot. And then when you figure out what your purpose is in that depot, then you figure out how to prepare. But from the expert side, and I'd say the police side, and Phil, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I would say the police side is the most kind of, I don't want to say them, but it's the most balanced. I mean, because as a police officer, you're not working for anybody, right? Your, your job. So if you're a police officer listening to this and you're going to get your deposition taken, your job is to go in there and tell the truth, the neutral, balanced, unbiased, honest to God truth. And, you know, and to go in there and, and just present fact. And so when preparing for it, I mean, what are, what are some of the things that you guys like to ask of the police officers? It always seems like in depots, where I follow up the police officers, the, the officers are always lay, used to lay the foundation, just kind of tell like, what's the basis of what happened out there? Yeah. I mean, the problem I think with a lot of police officers is they do not want to be in this de depot. They do not want to be in the room. They don't want to be part of this. You know, it's a civil case. They don't have to be there. You've got to subpoena them. Uh, and I find it real difficult because a lot of times they don't want to take a position. So their report says X. And a lot of times they'll just say, that's what my report is. Well, is it more likely than not? I don't know about that. That's just my opinion. So you have a problem with them sometimes helping you satisfy the burden that you need, even though, you know, they agree with you. They just sometimes do not want to be part of that. So yes, oftentimes the best role for a investigating officer uh, that's not a reconstructionist in a depot is just kind of figuring out what were the facts? Where was this at? Where did you see tread start? You know, if there's if there's an issue with marks on the road, you know, whether it be yaw marks or brake marks or skid marks, whatever you want to call them, you know, where did that start? And how did you define that that was related to this crash and not another one? Some of those things that you know they're going to go after your reconstructionist about later, you can sort of lock those in early on. And, and because of that, honestly, I don't, Police officers are not high on my list of people to depose in most cases. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the way it is here. And I mean, Phil, how often do you hear officers say, you know, ah, it's a civil issue, not my problem. Yeah. We hear it quite a bit. Yeah. You know, a variety and, of things, both from traffic to criminal. Yeah. And, and so, you know, but if, if you're an officer listening to this, I, I kind of want you guys to shift your mindset a little bit because you have to remember you, you took an oath to get justice for victims, right? And, and to protect innocent parties and, and going in and giving your testimony on things is part of that, of protecting the innocent victims and getting justice for them. So just because it's civil doesn't mean your job is done. You still have a, an obligation to the innocent party um, to go out here and report fact and to testify to that fact. Yeah, I kind of want to step in. I, I mean, and I, and I disagree with you a little bit on that. Um, ah, tough. Hold on. Let me find the mute button. 
I, I, it is not the role of the police officer to get justice for the uh, the victim or the innocent party. Their job is to gather the facts, gather the evidence, conduct an investigation as thorough as within their scope of training and experience and expertise within their role within their company uh, and their department and report that accurately and truthfully. Ultimately, it becomes the, the decision of the court or the jury as far as justice goes for the victim. Now, no, that's a, if they do that's their a better, job, yeah, that's if a they way do their job, it. then their job rolls over and makes a decision for the jury or the judge very easy. But I don't think it's the role of the officer to, to get the justice. Dang. All right, Justin, hold on. I'm going to need you to plug your ears for a second. I don't want you to hear this, but yeah, Phil, you're <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, where I end up, where, where I find police officer depots the most consequential are drunk driving cases where I don't really care if they tell me they're drunk. I do care that they said, you know, they couldn't do the like uh, walk in a line and they stumbled and they smelled and all of those things. They helped me set up the fact they were intoxicated. I don't need them to say they were intoxicated. You just give me all those facts and I put that in front of a jury. And if they did their field sobriety correctly, all those facts are going to be enough to get me there. And I think, you know, and I think to officers um, and, and I'm not trying to sound cynical or anything, but we can, you know, officers can be their own worst nightmare sometimes too, when it comes to, to, um, going beyond they they've seen it, they've witnessed it, they've been part of it, they, et cetera. Um, but they're it, it's beyond their scope. And Eric, you and I have talked about this. Oh my gosh, a bazillion times. And they, and they go out on that limb a little bit farther than what they should. And that actually becomes problematic for you as the attorney. Um, if you're a plaintiff attorney, obviously, you know, because they I may think, lay well, out actually, a, it could be problematic either side. Yeah. Depending absolutely. On what the officer said. But they could lay out a great foundation that the other side ends up just, just pouncing on it and, and tearing apart because they went too far on the limb. Um, it's yeah. just, it's back to that stay in your lane, stay in your scope, stay in, you know, and that's hard. That's hard for humans. I think in general. Yeah. I think one thing I have seen and that has always worked out for me is cops. I have seen take hard lines and become really good witnesses for me when they get a defense lawyer that shows up and thinks they're going to Perry Mason cross that cop and show they're not trained. They don't know what they're doing. Well, that has made cops I've seen just dig their heels in and yeah. become my best witness. And I don't care if they're out on a limb at that point, because what are you going to do? Go in front of a judge and say, this police officer is not qualified. Um, it's pretty rare that you're going to see a judge say, I mean, look, these weren't big, you know, how many roles were there kind of opinions uh, in a rollover case? These were kind of simple opinions and, you know, you'll get them just force a cop to take a hard line. And that's always worked out great for me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what Nobody likes to be told they're wrong. Yeah. And that's it. You know, and I think that's the one thing though, if I can offer any advice to any officers listening is just be careful in the depots though, because we do, we have a, we don't like to be questioned. You know, that that's an attack as an officer. That's an attack on our um, authority when somebody questions us um, and just watch that, because even just reading the transcripts and Phil, I mean, you know, how many times have oh, you yeah. read the transcript and you can literally read the, the transcript in the officer's tone that, you know, he's testifying in <laughs> because he's been backed into a corner or somebody's forced him to take yeah. that hard line and they're questioning him. Just watch the way that you come off and, so, and the words that you say. War story. Uh, I I am deposing a, um, we have a DWI task force here in San Antonio, and there's a new officer who'd been brought on. And this was one of her first field sobriety tests uh, as a new part of that DWI task force. I depose her first and she was pretty good, but she didn't want to really be there, get too involved, cut to defense lawyer crossing her. And I think her first question was, Officer so and so, how many times did you fail the bar ex- bar exam after you spent three years in law school? So the defense lawyer had gone, dug up her history, realized she had failed the bar exam multiple times, and that's how she starts. And she just then ruins the defense lawyer's case. I mean, was remembering things that she had forgotten. I mean, just became my best witness because that's how the defense lawyer decided to treat this, you know, public servant getting paid a taxpayer's salary who's just there by subpoena and you want to embarrass her for failing the bar 
I mean, it was just such a great lesson for a young lawyer who's sitting there to watch and go. (laughs) And and from what I understand, the bar is a pretty easy test. I mean, from everything I hear, I hear it's super easy. No reason to fail it. Every, everybody passes it on the first try. Right. Uh Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's the, that's the same thing. And, and, you know, attorneys love to ask, you know, how many times have you failed the ACTAR test or something? How many times did it take you to pass the ACTAR test? And it's like, well, first you have to understand that it's only got a 30% pass rate ever you know, of all attempts, like not just on first attempt. So, you know, yeah, I mean, they do, uh, you know, it, it's weird when you get asked those questions and if you're an expert, you know, or you're a police officer, don't be afraid of them. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, you never ask a police officer who's there as a police officer, a question like that. If you're a yeah. paid expert, yeah, I'm going to just beat you. Oh over. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It, but yeah, it, as a police reality. officer, reality. Yeah. You know, there's a difference between somebody who's showing up there getting $6 for their subpoena fee and somebody getting paid $400 an hour or whatever it is. I yeah. mean, juries don't feel bad for an expert. I mean, yeah. really, that, that's what one thing people I think forget is juries already have a raised eyebrow towards an expert the minute they sit up on that stand and they're kind of looking for reasons to to ignore what you're saying. Yeah. Yep. You know, I, I mean, I, I do have to, so in Ohio, they do take good of us. Our, uh, our, our depositions, we get $12 for that subpoena. Nice. So, nice. Yeah. I mean, you know, it almost covers my tank of gas to get to wherever it is. <laughs> I mean, that, that might be it here too. I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> I was like, man, $6, $6 when that started. started. <laughs> so, all right. So as the, so then let's transition here and talk a little bit to the experts and then we're going to talk to the attorneys. So as the experts, so as you're getting ready to have your deposition taken, what kinds of things, if you're new to this game, do you think like, what should the expert be studying? What should it be sharp on? What does he absolutely need to know the, you know, without a doubt, what does he need to know coming into that, into depositions? Because obviously we don't know what you guys are going to ask. Sure. What's a good Um, base. What's a good rule of thumb. So I I think there's kind of a few rules for an expert and kind of, I mean, I now hire my experts knowing who they are in depositions. So uh, first of all, be polite, be nice. Don't be combative. Don't be argumentative. Don't be smarter than everybody else. I mean, that stuff backfires and makes you look like shit, I think. And I love those experts. Those are my favorite, the smarter than thou guys. Um, Second, know your role. I mean, you should have a finite world of experience and expertise in this case, and you stay there. And outside of that, I have no opinions. And that's it. Um, You get a lot of them that just, you know, they don't like to say they don't know something. So they're always going to know something. Uh, also know your file. I mean, it, it, I'm a big preparer, uh, for expert depositions. And I can tell you, it is very rare that I feel like the experts prepared. Um, they won't know their file. They won't know what they've read. They, you know, they'll have experts, uh, they'll have deposition testimony and they're in their, in their file highlighted. And they'll just not know that it says things that is, that are very, uh, contrary to their opinions. So, I mean, you know, look, be a professional, um, know your, know your role and know it limited because you should have a limited role in a case if you're an expert and know your file. Um, you know, I think the second level to that is consider how you're going to be crossed. You know, think about what would you do to yourself if you were on the other side of this case and prepare for that. Um, you know, I mean, I think that's just general stuff that people should be doing if they're getting paid, what experts are getting going to get paid. Uh, they should be ready for a cross-examination uh, on top of presenting their opinions in a, in a professional way that's that's based on the facts. Yeah. You know, and if you guys aren't doing this, this was is something that you should be doing absolutely to, to piggyback on your point. So if you've listened to any of our previous episodes and we talked about our peer review episode. So if I'm the one working the case, Phil's going to do my peer review and he works it. If I'm we're working plaintiff or defense. He'll work the other side and attack my report. That's how he peer reviews it. He doesn't just proofread it and go, yep, no, no errors. And he attacks it. And then when we get ready for depots and trial, me and him will sit back down and he'll get out his peer reviewed report with his notes and my report and we'll do some battle. And I think a lot of experts don't do that because you don't like the, it hurts to, to be questioned on your findings and to be gone after and, and gone and not like, well, are you sure the drag factor could be this? I mean, ruthlessly go after. And there's been times that we've hung up on each other 
<laughs> a lot we, of those. I was going to say, we, Justin, the next one, we got, we ought to call you in and just be a silent observer because you'll laugh to. hysterically. Yeah. Click yeah. the, click the end do. button on the video. <laughs> <Click>. <laughs> but we do. Um, you know, and I never used to be that way. And, and I, I think when Eric and I first partnered up years ago, um, you know, we looked a lot at a lot of different things. and We looked at things a lot of different ways and whatnot and wanted to make sure you know that when you're peer reviewing it, it you know you're, you're you're coming to kind of the same you're not gonna come to the exact same conclusion but you're gonna come really close probably based on the methodology that 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 they used in their report and yeah. now it's just totally different now it it's it's just brutal i mean like i said like eric said that's the god's honest truth um well, we've hung up on each other, not talked to each other for a couple of days. I mean, Text them and be like, you know what? We'll, gets, we'll pick this back up tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And then you hear the bam, slam phone gets hung up. on. You know, there, there are certain areas that require expert. Accident reconstruction is one of them that requires. And I can tell you because of the oil and gas industry here, we have had just this explosion in crashes. We've had an explosion in that industry. When I first became a lawyer, I could name a handful of good accident recon guys. I mean, I keep seeing new names that I've never seen before and it shows in their depots. But, you know, the one thing I think from an expert standpoint is if you continuously be the professional who is fully prepared and does a good job and, and good job doesn't mean you're good for them all the time. Good job means when you finally are deposed and they have paid you all the money to get you through a report and deposition, you are right on the facts, you are right on your opinions and you are prepared for your depot. If you become that guy, like there are some in Texas, every crash, there's a race to hire them first and the defense takes them more seriously. And that makes, you know, I'll pay more to get, there's a guy to Dallas that I really like. I'll pay more to get him. I know it's going to be a beating on the billing, but the defense has also probably called him very quickly thereafter trying to get him as well. And in depot, they know, you know, he's going to be really unimpeachable. And that makes yeah. a big difference. Yeah, let me yeah, ask you absolutely. something, Justin, because yeah. you know Eric and I have talked about this over the the last few years. Um, if you're rude to our guest, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> I just I really want to get um, you know Justin's input on um, you know you had kind of alluded to it earlier in in, in your uh, in one of your responses um, to having a narrowed uh, focus or whatnot, and, and Eric and I talk about this a lot about a scope uh, sure. for the reconstruction and having a clear cut well-defined scope because when you think about it and and i'm sure justin you've probably seen this i would think as many depositions as you do where someone will come in as an expert they don't have a scope so if you're following the scientific method and you don't have a scope are you really following the method where's your theory you know i mean yeah. it, it, the scope kind of lays out the the first step yeah i mean so i think you get more of that problem in medical right if somebody has a medical degree they could be an ENT, but they're going to talk about, you know, the long-term complications with your client's broken foot. I mean, they just believe that they have gotten a matter. I'm not shitting you. This is real common. <laughs> they just believe that because they spent, you know, two weeks during their internship in orthopedic that they know it all. And you really see this a lot with biomechanical. You get a guy who's got an MD degree and got an engineering degree in 72. And now he's a biomechanical engineer, which is, we know that but that's bullshit, but there's a need for bios. That's a hard expertise to really get trained in. So yeah. there's not many out there. So you got these guys that are kind of just like, oh, I'm a bio. From the recon standpoint, you get recons who start to trend into bio a little bit when they shouldn't. Yeah, that's human that's factor, dangerous. They should not. And so, you know, you should have a well-defined scope. But part of that well-defined scope is knowing the scope of the other expertise. Cause if you don't know when it becomes human factors, it's hard for you to decide what your scope is. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and that's it. I mean, you know, like we just picked up a, a huge case over the summer and, you know, kind of war story thing of, yeah, you know, we got, we dove into it and all of a sudden we're like, man, I think part of this case is not just what we thought, but I think part of it's also going to be a tire failure and a yeah. failure on, on part of the tire company that put the tire on and everything else. And so, you know, the first call that you had to make was to the attorney and say, hey, look, I think this is going to be outside the scope of our expertise. I mean, yeah, as reconstructionists, do we get some training on tires? Yeah. Are we the world's experts on tires? Nope. No. You know, and so we have a really good relationship with arguably what I feel is the best tire expert in the world. And I'm like, this is yeah. the guy you need. Like, call him up. We do business with him. He, he, he cuts a, a special rate for people that you know, he's partnered with us on. I mean, it's something that we negotiated for our clients. And, uh, 
you know, we're like, call this guy, get him in on it. And so his scope is limited to the tire yep. and our scope is limited to the crash. And it's like, that yeah. way we can complement each other, but you're not going to have that cross battle in depot. If somebody wants to ask me about the tire, I wasn't asked to opine on that. But you can opine on post tire failure handling and control. I mean, you know, you've created a whole separate crash for you at that moment. Um, yeah. You get to opine on. And also, if my expert calls me and says, hey, there's this big deep pocketed defendant you missed, I'm going to be real happy about that. Yeah. Yep. Just exactly. And that's, it, yeah, we we're like, Hey, uh, <laughs> yeah, you might, uh, you might, cause it's, that one's going after the actual, uh, not only who installed it, but the manufacturer, I think there's a manufacturer defect. Yeah. So you have know. you seen that very often, Justin, where you you've seen where experts have, have reached beyond because, and, and sometimes I don't know, maybe it's pride. Maybe it's, they don't know a, uh, a, a person who has the expertise in that field. So they kind of, glance into it and overstep overreach you see that much i know who they are and i don't use them i mean (laughs) i'm saying even if you're if even if you're on the other side of it you know yes that's that's what i'm telling you especially in the medical world i'm telling you you can't get a doctor to tell you that they don't know something about medical you know no matter what almost from my standpoint i like to use kind of green experts who are who are industry experts so not litigation experts but really are doing this stuff um, in that sometimes they have a hard time drawing the line because they do everything, you know, they kind of just do it in their industry, but sometimes you'll see that kind of having a hard time drawing a line. And with those guys, you got to read their report and make them understand everything a little bit better because they, you know, just, it's all one thing to them. But from the defense side, I see it a lot. Yeah. You know, honestly, from the defense side, I see people that are paid much higher than the plaintiff side. And so, you know, look, if you're looking at getting a repeat client, who paid you $48,000 through depot in this case, you know, you're going to probably be more of an advocate than you would be if, okay, I don't care if they're a repeat client. You know? Yeah. Yep. And so you brought up two interesting things before we transition to the attorney side. That I just want to point out to experts, you know, one is um, stop. You kind of hit on it there of being the jack of all trades and me and Phil are very guilty of this. You know, that's what I tried to do with Crash Tech Uh, originally is I said, okay, you know what? I want to be the jack of all, like we're the one stop shop. We're going to be experts in this and this and this and this and this. And then just a couple of years ago, I I got uh, hooked up with a guy who who really did like a lot of business mentoring for me. And he looked at our website and he's like, dude, I don't know what the hell you do. He's like, you're so confusing. You're all over the place. You know, he's like, what do you do? And uh, after that moment, I said, you know what? We cut out everything else. And we're like, we're going to be the best reconstructionists out there. And that's all we're going to do. And that's going to be our specialty, you know? And so figure out if you're in, if you own an expert company, figure out what you want to do and become the best at it. I mean, because that's how you really help your clients. You don't help them by being mediocre in every area. You help them by being the best in the area that they need help in. Right. You know, um, so, you know, that's one thing that I would challenge you on. Uh, but then the other point too, is, uh, and I've made this a lot. You can be the best investigator in the world. Absolutely phenomenal. Hands down, investigate the hell out of anything, know the physics, know the science, can write the formulas, whatever. If you can't clearly and easily uh, tell people how you got to your findings and you can't communicate those findings to a jury, you're worthless as an investigator. If you fall apart in depot and fall apart on the stand, I mean, Justin, I mean, how good are they to your case? They gave you a great report, but they can't, they can't tell anybody about it. Yeah. Those guys don't stay around. So invest, don't skip you guys anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Invest in yourself and learn how to speak to people, get up in front of crowds, get out of your comfort zone and get out there and actually start talking and learn how to communicate. And from your Jack of all trade, uh, you know, Jack of all trades. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I like to go out That's on rant. Right. So if I say something, just correct it. It's yeah, fine. Just, Bill yeah, does it all the time. <laughs> um, from that same standpoint. So the expert that, you know, I made a joke on LinkedIn. That's how we got together was this guy kept going, oh, that's possible. It's possible. And I finally like, you could be cooking meth in your, in your garage then. Right. And he was like, well, I guess it's possible, Mr. Hill. But that same expert, if you go to his website is a everything. And so part of my cross with him was, really getting him to take a hard line on how much of an expert he is. He's an expert in this and he's an expert in that. And he's all these things. I've been hired by all these people. Well, in my case, it was really important that he did not use his expertise to find out all these facts that were in controversy. So he used his expert 
expertise in one part that helped him, but he just ignored his expertise in all these other parts. It's all over his website. So he, you know, it's kind of a digital forensic thing. He could have done a phone download. He could have gone into the ser- the guy's server. He could have done all of these things. He didn't do any of them, even though he says he's qualified to, he's got proper methodology. He does it all the time. But in my case, he just said the defense lawyer didn't pay me to do that. So it's great. So now I get to say, look, the defense lawyers want y'all to close your eyes to the facts the same way he told the expert, close your eyes to what you're an expert on. <laughs> so, I mean, it can, it can, you know, it could kick you in the butt too. That seems yeah, that so, so interesting. You, you say that because Eric, could you imagine had, that? Like, so you let the defense expert tell you where to go with this investigate. Like, aren't you supposed to be an independent investigator? Well, you know, Eric, and you think about the times that, that you and I have had this conversation. Oh my gosh. I, I wish I had a, a dollar bill for every time we've had it, but you, you know, at the end of the day, and especially in crash recon, the, the opposing experts looking at the same crash report, they're looking at the same witness statements. They're looking at the same, a lot of times the same evidence and and so on. And, and how many times have you seen where an expert will be like, Ooh, I don't like that piece of evidence because that hurts my scope. So I'm not going to look at it. Mm-hmm. It's glaringly obvious, but I'm not going to look at it. And they'll focus in or hone in on one out of five and really just go down this path and sell their theory of why that's the only way this thing could have happened and negate the other four. How many times have we, we've we seen that? If it's there, you've got to address it. Yeah. Are, you, are you talking you about to look the, at it? Are you talking about the the 50 miles an hour and a 25 by the bicyclists and we completely left out the speed limits of the roadway. It wasn't even addressed. I mean, and that's just one of so many examples where we'll see that. And, you know, granted, you know, experts look at other experts reports and we, we tend to, to glean on obvious things that are like, man, that jumps out like a, you know, like crazy. Yeah. But if we're seeing that everybody else is going to see it too. And you hit the nail on the head at the very beginning, Justin, when you said the jury see through this, that they're not stupid. You know, yeah, if somebody's ignoring the, the the speed limit, I mean, things like that, they'll pick up on anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Right well, now. I mean, in this in this case, you had an, an expert who we had two bicyclists coming down a, the, the steepest grade in the area. I mean, it is this is a, a 35 percent downhill grade. It's steep. And they get up to 52. A police officer gets them on radar and they pass one of the signs who records their speed at 52. We got that. And they had GPSs on their bike that had them at 52. So we had all three of these things. And uh, the expert blamed a truck parked on the roadside for the crash and never even looked at speed. Didn't even talk about speed in the report once. <laughs> and and I'm like listed everywhere. <laughs> like, so like, I, think, I think speed might have been a contributing factor to this. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the, big, the biggest case I had a few years ago was a 18 wheelers driving down the road in rural San Antonio, Bear County. I mean, it is three in the morning, dark, there's nothing out there. Uh, He's in a gravel truck and another uh, gravel truck around a bend had, God knows why, done all this maneuvering and jackknifes himself shoulder to shoulder, uh, blocking all lanes of travel. But his his tractor is in the lane facing oncoming traffic, but his trailer is jackknifed across all the lanes of travel. So if you're a guy coming down the road, oh, you're fixing to pass a truck. Uh, so he's going, he thinks he's fixing to pass the truck and then he, you know, hits the trailer and he, he doesn't make it. And their defense was that in his lane would have been one blinking light on the trailer. And that's it. That was their whole theory is he should have seen that one blinking light. Not the, not that there's a tractor coming towards him with all the rack of lights and headlights and the expectancy in the middle of the night and there's no lighting and there's nothing. That was their whole theory. And sometimes you think these people just find a theory so they can try to get you to come a little bit off your demand. I mean, there was zero chance. I mean, a new lawyer showed up a month before trial and he was like, we're not, we're not saying this in trial. We're just going to say all our fault, uh, but don't give them too much money. I mean, he was a good lawyer who tried hundreds of cases and that's what a good lawyer should have done. But the other guy who was the litigator workup guy, you know, spent tons of money for a theory that that one blinking light in the road should have been seen. Yeah. And so this is this is not a dig at you. This is an inside joke for me and Phil. But guys, this will get you interested. So you tune in in a future episode with Spencer talking about commercial trucks. Phil, I wonder if that was a jackknife or a trailer swing. 
So that's anyway. true. Or <laughs> you're in the inverted D slide. <laughs> so anyway, so if you guys want to know what we're talking about, tune into our future episode with Spencer Zubera talking about uh, commercial motor vehicle crashes. But anyway, all right. So Justin, let's transition to uh, let's transition to attorneys. So getting ready for a depot because just like you said, you feel like a lot of uh, experts don't know their file. I'm not going to lie. Sitting on it from the expert side, I feel like a lot of attorneys like looked at their file, maybe at breakfast before they try and take my depot. And and they ask me stuff that I, you, you almost have to scratch your head and you're like, did you even read the case? I mean, are you just making it up? Yeah. Or, and I mean, how can you effectively, and I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, like, I always feel like, you know, you walk away from a depot and, and instead of being like, well, that was a good depot or something like, you're like, man, you, you know, you talk to your attorney that, that you're working with and you're like, man, I think we killed them. Like I would wait for their demand letter and, or, you know, their, their settlement offer after that. Um, I, I mean, what are things that like, how should an attorney be preparing for this? Because I feel like you should be prepared for a depot and not just reading the file for the first time, right before you step in there with an expert. I mean, look, it's it's the whole world and the whole spectrum in the lawyer world. I mean, there are lazy lawyers that don't prepare. We, I mean, you see it, y'all see it. And then there's the other side that y'all think are unprepared and they have just created a bad setup for you in trial. Uh, my old boss was really good at that. It might be a 45 minute depot. I'd leave and be like, well, what did, what, what was that all about? And he, you know, he would have some great theory that I hadn't really thought about just because he had more experience than me. Um, from my standpoint, um, I'm going to be prepared. And I love the fact that most lawyers are not because guys like y'all are sitting there and nine out of 10 lawyers you see aren't prepared. And maybe today you're like, ah, shit, he's not going to be prepared. And so you kind of phone it in. Well, when you have a guy who's really prepared and y'all phoned it in, it's going to be a bad day for y'all. And so, you know, you have to be prepared and a lawyer has to be prepared. Uh, And a prepared lawyer, I think is always more prepared. I never run into an expert that's as prepared as me. I mean, it's just, it never happens. Uh, so for my preparation, I do a few things. Uh, first, I want to know, do I care? I mean, do I even care what this guy's opinions are? Like if, if you're opining on, I've got you know a client right now that's got epilepsy. I don't care if they show up with somebody that says, well, their epilepsy isn't that bad. <laughs> okay. Go in front of a jury and say something like that. And you're going to look yeah. terrible. Uh, so sometimes I don't really care what the opinion is either because it's so far out there or it's really just like shades of gray. Um, So that's one of the big things. Do I care? And if I do care, what's going to help me either get them out of the case or sort of cross their bases? The biggest thing I normally do in a deposition is for an accident reconstructionist, I think it's really just narrowing down where's the disagreement. And really, once you break it down, if you have too good a reconstructionist, the difference is going to be pretty finite. I mean, it's going to become, uh, they, they got them at 54 and you've got them at 47 miles an hour or whatever. You don't normally get this huge range of differences between reconstructionists in my experience. So I want to know what it is. I want to tell my, at my expert to tell me why he's right and the other guy's wrong. And I want to kind of set up and see if I can get that guy to trip or show that he doesn't really understand why there is a difference. Um, if this is a podcast for real, you know, for all experts, uh, I will say experts in the soft sciences, though, I mean, those are just sitting ducks because soft sciences have so much peer reviewed literature out there. Uh, peer reviewed literature, if they prove it up as a learned treatise, meaning it's something people in our industry read and it's authoritative, you're going to find stuff that's just going to help you gut their opinion. So, if it's a soft science, I'm going to spend a lot of time reading peer-reviewed literature and do the same thing I do on all of them, but I'm going to cross them on the science that's out there. Uh, it just kind of depends on what kind of expert, but uh, I think the first thing you figure out is, d- does it matter? And the second thing is, how do we figure out where we're different? And then if you've got one of these soft science people that just have gone out on a limb, you can just you can just gut them or you can set them up to be gutted. Yeah. And, you know, I think the, the, just the one that always just makes me think of that. And and we had him on a pot. We have the guy that literally wrote the book on this um, is the, is the blanket applying 1.5 second perception response time to all situations. Anybody on any situation is going to perceive and react in 1.5 seconds. And it's just, I agree with you hundred percent. I think guys that hang their hat on that and blanket apply, you're going to get beat up. And you're going to get beat up hard if you have an attorney that's read the books or understands the science of how those tests were conducted, uh, you know, and, and that's the man that can be so damaging. 
I think that also is so like expert heavy, like it's so academic in the expert world that when you finally sit down with a jury, a jury is going to understand like, okay, this perception reaction time is academic because perception and reaction really includes looking at everything going on at once. But in a case, they're like that blinking light. He should have seen that blinking light, immediately applied his brakes. He would have this much time from seeing it to pushing his brakes and he'd have been able to stop. Well, that's not what goes on. You see this this truck to your left, you see blinking lights over here. It's dark. You're in your truck. You're checking your speed. I mean, those practical realities don't flesh out in depositions because nobody's going to admit that that's a reality. You're just going to say, well, the perception reaction time is this. So they should have been able to. So those don't ever stress me out as much because I don't think that I don't think juries view our life in a vacuum. And those require you view in a situation in a vacuum. See, and I think that's a good point to make there because that's what I see, at least up here in Ohio, it seems like is is attorneys, they use the depot as the point to try those facts instead of putting it in front of a jury. You you know what I mean? And and so it does, it just becomes this argument. And in a depot, you're not really going to have a winner. Your expert's going to draw the line in the sand and say, you know what? This is what it is. This is what the text shows. This is what the expert shows. This is this, this is, and and he's not going to move off of it. And, and you, the attorney, are going to keep arguing. And then the other attorney is going to object and say something. And then you're going to have that whole, like, there's no speaking objections. Let's call the judge, blah, blah, blah. Right. And then you get that whole back and forth that we read on the transcripts all the uh-huh. time. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, yeah, I think the better place for that's in trial, not in depot, yeah. but, you know, lock the expert down. Okay. So is it your opinion that this was 1.5? Yeah. In all cases? Yeah. Okay. And then take that to a jury. Yeah, so many things become litigation driven and they stay there for a while and then they just kind of disappear. And a new thing is the new litigation driven theory or science or data point that really I don't think matters outside of people that just kind of live in this bubble. Yeah. So let me ask you this. So you have, and, and it's it's interesting uh, to do this. Demo. There are some attorneys that we love to work with and they are the attorneys that aren't reconstructionists themselves, but understand what reconstruction is and know enough about it to be dangerous in court. And, and the fact that, you know, you brought up, you know, yaw marks and skid marks. I know that there's a difference between the two and things like that. If you're going to get into PI work as an attorney and you're going to go do battle with a, a reconstructionist in a depot, how important is it to at least have an understanding of the terms and, and just the general practices of reconstruction? So for reconstruction, I think it's super important because I don't think you can draw the lines of the difference in opinions without understanding what the terminology is, whether it be skid or yaw marks. Um, I mean, that that sort of kind of sets you up. Now, from how you get there, I think the most important thing is if you're paying an expert, whatever they charge to come down and work a scene, you know, get in your truck, car, whatever, go meet them. You know, why did they paint that? What does that mean to you? What is this mark? How is it different than that mark? Why did one start here and one start here? I mean, that's that's free training for you. I mean, and that's on the job training and that stuff's going to matter. And when you see it, it'll jog your memory. And so, you know, as a young lawyer, when we had the experts go to the, the warehouse where all the automotive vehicle uh, defect vehicles were, I'd go down there. And recons were explaining, hey, this was a one and a quarter roll. This was a three roll, you know, and why? And so you see scratch patterns and all of that stuff. And you can, oh, well, there's blood pooling here. So it landed on its roof. All that kind of stuff uh, just, I mean, it, it was the world's best training ground. And once you sort of understand the 101 of it, the rest, I think, gets a lot easier. But you've got to understand sort of the world that the experts work in to even have an idea how to ask a question. Yeah. You know, in one of our on one of our prior episodes, uh, one of the attorneys, Jessica, she said the same thing. Like she always goes to the scene with her experts. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't stress that enough. I love it when attorneys want to come out to the scenes because there is there's no there is nothing that I can show you in a photograph that's that's better than actually walking you through the scene and saying, hey, look, look at this. Look at the view obstruction this creates. Look at this, you know, and, and being able to walk through that and, and show you. Um, so that you understand firsthand, you know, as 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 this cohesive team moving forward, then of of what we're looking at and what we're trying to explain. Um, so, when preparing for a depot, if you're going to take the opposing counsel's experts' depot, will you get a hold of your expert and 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 go over kind of the what what your thoughts are, some of the areas to look at? I mean, is that a good time if if you have further questions to go out to the scene with your expert? I mean, is that do you Sometimes. find that worth? Because your expert obviously isn't going to do that for free. 
And I don't yeah. think you would ask them to, you're not going to be like, Hey bro, like, you right. know, come out to the scene and spend hours with me and don't bill me anything. Um, so, I mean, is that worth the charge on your end to prepare you to go in and, and do battle a little bit better? I mean, sometimes. So, I mean, if I can read the reports and, oh, here's the difference, I don't really need my expert to, you know, block out time and do a phone call with me to tell me something I can read. But if I really don't understand it or feel like there's there's sort of holes there, yeah, I'm going to get on the phone with them. I mean, you've already spent that much to have them work up the scene, to have them give you a report, to get them ready for depot, probably. The, the, the additional cost, the differential there is not enough to not be ready. Yeah. Especially, I mean, when you're talking, you know, if that's, if that's the the difference in getting policy limits or, you know, getting uh, just 50%, I mean, that's, that could make a, a huge difference for you. Yeah, I mean, your client is letting you spend their money. You owe them a fiduciary duty. And if you're saying, well, I've spent 12, but I wasn't going to spend 13 um, to make a big difference in your case. I don't think you've got a good argument for that. You know, my first boat. That's a good first, point. Yeah. First boss said, uh, you know, don't ever trust a lawyer that wants a bass boat. Like, you know, it's their money we're spending. So yes, I'm spending it, but I need to think about it. Is it in their best interest to spend this additional money or not? And sometimes it might hurt, but sometimes it just is. Yeah. So, all right. So I got to ask you, and, and just because this is hilarious and this is what originally made me reach out to you. So you have this expert that you're deposing. And, and so this guy literally has every answer to you was it, it, it could, it's possible. So not all of them, but he's the one that, so they basically, the, it's a sex assault case uh, regarding two people that met on the internet uh, at a website. Say, don't, don't give me like, don't give anybody like, don't give away your case, you know, secrets. And oh, no. stuff, but yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. No. I don't, but the website has a name that's common to other websites. And so he just took one specific iteration of this website, searched it through a website uh, that will tell you if it was around on X date and said it went around on X date. Therefore they never met on that website, but there's, you know, 10 versions of this name that were around then. And so, yeah, this one was around then they could have met on there. Well, that's possible. Well, this one had all of these things you said it would need. So I just kept bringing up all these things that he had ignored. Uh, look, if you had looked in his phone, you would have been able to determine if he had visited this website. Yeah, it's possible. Everything was possible. All these things that were within his realm of expertise and on his website were all possible. They could have proven my case. And so he just said it enough. I finally started saying stupid things were possible and he just agrees. Well, I guess that's right, Mr. Hill. I guess it is possible. I mean, it's just, you know, he's going to be a clown in front of a, in front of a depot. I mean, and admitted of, that it's possible that he is cooking meth in his basement. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about breaking bad at the moment. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, but if, if you're it, an expert, that's bad. I wouldn't, uh, I don't know that I would agree with that one. So, I mean, yeah. So I've only had recently, I had a jury just die laughing when I played an expert step on trial and it was because preparation. So this guy is hired to say my client was not injured. And if she was injured, it was from something else, a doctor. So I go to pose him. He's a Texas doctor. Well, because we have a, a bar association that kind of helps each other, I'm asking around and somebody actually said, I think he used to be in Washington. So I start digging through Washington malpractice filings. And I find that he had like 13 allegations of sexual impropriety from patients. Um, and I find one of them where he actually admits to the medical board and gets a sanction for kissing a patient on her back while she was getting a procedure and had her shirt off. Just some weird, creepy stuff. That's so I'm creepy. proposing him. He's perfectly quaffed and he's unimpeachable. He's perfect. He thinks everything's great, you know? And so I start getting into the Washington stuff. Now, he tried to be a real jerk because when I went in to depose him, he made me depose him in a conference room table in the middle of a law co medical complex where there's patients coming and going in all these rooms around me the whole time, kind of like a bullpen. So yeah. he's there, nurses. It's just all distracting. So then I start going. And then on this date, uh, this this lady said you groped her breast and <laughs> just slowly getting more and more flustered. I'm on like seven, and nine and his staff is hearing this. So his staff probably didn't know he had all these. And then he's having to admit that he admitted and got sanctioned by the medical board for being sexually inappropriate with women while all these people are just coming and going. But his face is getting redder, his hair, he, he's he's like pulling his hair. So it's just getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> oh, and we played that in the trial and they are just, they're, they're all like holding their mouths and getting red faced because, you know, he just wasn't prepared. And I'm sure the defense lawyer did not know what they had hired. Actually, 
After the depot, he says, get the F out of my office. I went and stood outside waiting for my Uber. Defense lawyer comes out and says, I'll take you to the airport. Get in the car. And he goes, who the hell hired this guy? And I was like, one of your associates. He was like, what in the... I mean, it was just, it was just a terrible day for them. Yeah. That, let me guess that car ride. Uh, I, probably, I have a feeling there was a settlement pretty much reached <laughs> by the time you got to the airport. You had to try the case. <laughs> Did you really? Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because you said played in front of the jury. That's yeah, crazy. Oh, enough. my God. I can't admit. Oh man. I, yikes. I love that. That case was a case in which a car careens out of control, hits a uh, barrier in the middle of the roadway. Both the people have broken necks and it was all an accident reconstruction case about whether or not they lost control or they had been hit beforehand because the uh, UM policy in Texas requires there be some contact before loss of control. So that was a whole case. The whole case yeah. was they lose control or were they hit? And the car was kind of so mangled after the crash. It was very hard to tell. So it was lots of reconstructionists. That's similar to our special yeah, project exactly that we're working on. Phil. on, the, on yeah. the bypass. So, yeah. all right. So let, let's boil this down for everybody. And, and, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go too, too long here for everybody because everybody listens to our show. It seems like uh, on their way into work. So everybody should be getting to their offices now and getting off and ready to start the day. So Phil, um, before we go around and give our advice, let me, let me ask two, uh, a couple questions here, Justin. So, uh, personal opinion, right? Is it, do you catch more flies with, with honey than you do vinegar? If, if you know what I mean? Like, That's I don't know, do you, do you like, do you like to do the nice attorney thing or do you feel it's better to go in and start slamming stuff on the table and, and pointing your finger at the expert and getting combative? So it's going to depend on how the expert is. And I, and I think, experts are one of the only witnesses where the juries don't get offended. If you act that way, if the experts getting paid and they're being combative and they're being, you know, not going to answer a simple question and you get worked up, I think you have a lot more latitude in an expert depot to do that than any other depot as a lawyer. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree with you hundred percent. And, and actually, I don't know, have you ever seen the video of the expert? They show it in recon classes. I don't know if they show oh. it to you guys in law school. <laughs> And it's like That's from awesome. the 80s or something, like 80s, early 90s. <clears throat> and this expert's like sitting there and, uh, you know, he's so the, the attorney's like, so this guy traveled 10 feet in two seconds or something, like, you know, whatever. And he's like, yeah, he's like, so how how many feet per second did he travel? And, and the expert's like, well, sir, I can't do that calculation without my calculator. And he's like, you can't do a simple <laughs> per second calculator. And you're at, no, sir, I don't do my calculations without calculators. And like, so the attorney just kept going. And finally, this guy just blows it. He's like, I am not going to sit here and be badgered by, I mean, and just blows up on this video deposition. And, and yeah, you, you play that in court and, and the attorney's granted all the leeway in the world. So if you're the expert, that's, that's bad on you, not on the attorney. That's, that's a hundred percent on you. So I, I think you hit hit the nail right on the head. I, I mean, you know, the attorney can be any way he wants. As the expert, you need to be the calm professional and talk about the facts and and the sciences and 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 ultimately how that led to your opinions. Yeah, and and normally the lawyer's not on video either, so there are ways to maybe um, create some drama in the deposition room with an expert without your voice changing at all. Uh, and sometimes that can elicit a reaction on video from the expert when they forget that they're on video. Yep. I agree. Yeah. That, great point. So, all right. Uh, so Phil, if, if you could give, and, and Phil probably talk to the police officers, cause that's his, his bread and butter here of who he likes to talk to. So give our audience here and something they could do. So if they get deposed tomorrow, how could they do better than they did today? What, what's a, a word of advice from you, Phil? And Justin, we're going to come right around the screen and we're going to end with you because you're our guest. So you get the final word. Know your case. It's your work. And by the time you get deposed, who knows how long it's been? How many other cases have come in between your data deposition and the case in question? Know your case. Take the time to go back. Look at everything you looked at to come to your opinion. Don't just read your report. Look at all the evidence. Look at all the photographs. Almost like you're starting from scratch and, and reconstructing this event all over again. So you know it inside and out. And, and you are and you don't have to refer to anything to answer a question. And I, I, that's something that I've tried to do uh, in my professional, you know, in law enforcement. I don't like taking exhibits with me on the stand or I shouldn't say, but notes or what have you with me. I don't like doing that because the jury sees that. And it just 
paint you as an unprepared individual. You're going to get, and you need to expect at some point, the attorney, they're going to get you to, they're going to ask you a question that you just don't know the answer to. And you may have to refer. Don't try and BS your way through the question to try and distract. They're, trust me, the attorney in the room deposing you is smarter than you, than you think you are. <laughs> you know, they're a lot smarter than you and they know how to get you just to, to just basically make yourself look like an ass. Don't do it. Yeah. Attorneys are professional chess players. Yes, they are. I agree hundred yeah. percent. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, interestingly enough, and, and I'm going to kind of compound on your, so not only know your case, but let me just give you a, an example here of something. Watch, let me, let me just demonstrate something. All right. That dead air. How long did that seem? Seemed like a long time, right? That was five seconds. And so if you're unprepared and you constantly have to look at your report and look at your case file, that was five seconds of silence. Now think about that on the stand, you know, or in front of a jury or at a recorded deposition of how painful it is when you have to wait 30 seconds for, for somebody to look up a speed limit sign or how you did a calculation or, you know, some piece of fact, because you don't know it off the top of your head. So be prepared. But to, to go beyond that then is to be prepared and be able to speak well. When I see attorneys, and I love seeing these posts of, of young attorneys coming out, and, and I try and friend request as many as I can on Facebook, because it's, it's so fun to watch the journey from when you guys come out of law school and you just pass the bar uh, all the way up through when you guys become really good at your craft. And, uh, and I love attorneys will build mock podiums out of milk crates and everything else they can in their house in front of a mirror and we'll practice their opening statements, their closing arguments, and they'll practice that in front of a mirror to see how they look and how they sound and how they come across and, and their body, their, their posture, everything. Um, and if you're not doing that as an expert, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. So not only do you need to know your case, but you, know how to, you need to know how to present it well, clearly, convincingly, and in easy to understand terms because jurors should not be, if the attorneys did their job well, you should not have a bunch of engineers and reconstructionists on the jury. So they might not know industry jargon and, and acronyms and things like that. So you need to be able to speak clearly, convincingly, slowly, and, and, and be able to present your case. So Justin, a uh, piece of word of advice. So I think we went more towards the experts. So if you can speak to the attorneys, what is something they can do tomorrow if they got a deposition to do a little bit better than they did the day before? Well, I, I think, well, I want to touch on two points of both y'all made real quick. So as it, as it refers to looking at your notes, there's an expert that's really good that I've worked with multiple times. He turns his notes into exhibits. So when he gets asked a question about a calculation, well, let me show the jury and he pulls it up and he's, he, so it's him jogging his memory, but it looks like he's demonstrating to the jury how he got to his conclusions and it's super powerful and it doesn't look like he's not prepared. It looks like he's the teacher, which I think that's a good point. Y'all should be teachers as an expert. So you don't want to be the smartest guy in the room and be an a-hole because you know everything and you know the jargon and, and y'all don't know it. If you're talking down to them, they're not going to like you. If you're the teacher that is trying to help them understand and that comes across as sincere, you're going to be liked. And to the defense lawyer, when he asks you a question, oh, that's a really good I understand why you're coming from that. Well, let me show you how I arrived at my opinion. Those are the good experts. Um, so, you know, my advice for lawyers is if you've got an expert that's really good, don't give him a ton of time. Don't give him a ton of rope. Maybe he is not the guy that you want to spend much time crossing other than to figure out that one thing you disagree with so that you can argue it at closing. Uh, also, we haven't talked about this, but if you're a lawyer and you have an expert, make sure they understand your case. So their opinions matter, but don't let them stomp on other opinions or other things that will hurt you in the case. Um, and I think oftentimes people forget to even discuss their case with the expert. Um, so I think that you should do that if you're a lawyer. So they actually understand what you're doing in the bigger case outside of their one uh, area of testimony. Um, but, you know, look, any witness is better if they accept the fact that some things they don't know and they say, I don't know. And if they uh, also say, this is not something I was hired to look at, so I have not done enough work on it. I probably could, but I have not done enough work on it. I think from corporate reps to experts to any fact witness, I don't know in an honest way 
is powerful. It actually makes it look like you're there just to talk about what you do know. Um, from how to get ready as a lawyer, I think if you over prepare, just over prepare. I mean, you know, look, you can read a report, you know what area of testimony that they're going for, you know what your theory of your case is, prepare for that depot. And that should be kind of commonplace, but it's not as commonplace as it should be. Yep, I agree 100%. Well, that's going to wrap it up for the day, guys. As always, if you have a case that you want us to review for free or you just want to connect with us, jump on over to crashtechreconstruction.com. Also, remember to follow us on Facebook at Crash Tech, the Expert Angle Podcast. Make sure you subscribe to our show and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Crash Tech Reconstruction Services. And finally, remember to always leave your accident victims better off than you found them because at the end of the day, Everything we do is for that.